Good morning and hello. Welcome to local journalism uh, sub webinar this morning. Wherever you may be zooming in from, we're glad you're here. Um, uh, today, I would like to ask that everyone please remain on mute. And if you have questions during our program, please enter those in the Q&A section on your screen. We will be getting to questions towards the later part of the program. And now I'd like to introduce Sabina Murphy from Conrad Adenauer Schifftung. Hi, Sabina. Hi, Stacy. Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to today's discussion of local journalism, shrinking resources, growing challenges. It's the result of a collaboration of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung USA and Medill School of Journalism at Northwest University. My name is Sabine Murphy and I'm a program manager with the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, a German political foundation and think tank. During the past few months, I had the great pleasure to work with Tim Franklin and Penny Abernathy from the Medill School of Journalism on a series of workshops and interviews. We talked to media experts in a deep dive into the challenges of local journalism around the world. I want to sincerely thank Northwestern University for this collaboration and especially Tim Franklin and Penny Abernathy for their hard work, dedication and expertise they brought to every aspect of this project. Tim Franklin is a senior associate dean, professor and John M. Mutz chair in local news at Medill. Before joining Medill, Tim was the president of the Pointer Institute and a top editor at several metropolitan newspapers. Penelope Muse Abernathy is a visiting professor at Medill School. She's collaborating with Northwestern University's local news initiative and Spiegel Research Center. Penny is a former executive for the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and was the night chair in journalism and media economics at the University of North Carolina. She's well known for her groundbreaking research on news deserts and the state of local journalism. Tim and Penny will moderate this discussion. With this, I'm handing things over to them. Thank you. Thank you, Sabina, and good morning, uh, everyone, and welcome to this important and timely discussion about the state of local news in the US and around the world. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Sabina and the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung Foundation uh, for sponsoring this webinar and for its support of our project. Um, in a moment, I'll interview our very distinguished panel of speakers uh, this morning, but I first wanna provide some context for our discussion today titled Local Journalism, Shrinking Resources, Growing Challenges. Local news in the US and in many parts of the world is in absolute crisis. More than one in four newspapers, about 2,200, have shuttered in the US since 2005. The number of local newspaper journalists has fallen by more than half since 2008. About 1,900 communities in the US have no source of local news. More than 200 entire counties in the US home to millions of residents have no local news source. The pandemic is only accelerating these alarming trends. So, so why does the decimation of local news matter? After all, other industries have been disrupted with little impact uh, on the economy or on civic life. Well, it matters because as we'll hear shortly, local news is the sustenance of a self-governed democracy, providing news and information that citizens need to make decisions about their government institutions, about their own safety, and especially recently about their own health. As Washington Post media columnist Margaret Sullivan wrote just last week, quote, the demise of local news poses the kind of danger to our democracy that should send alarm sirens screeching across the land. Over the last several weeks, my Medill colleague Penny Abernathy and I have interviewed 17 influential journalists and researchers around the world about how the vaporizing of local news is affecting coverage of major issues of our time, like the pandemic, climate change, and government accountability. We'll be posting our report uh, on our insights uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're fortunate to have uh, with us this morning five of those experts uh, with us. Uh, I'll be joined in the questioning uh, by my Medill colleague, Penny Abernathy, uh, who Sabina said her pioneering research on local news deserts uh, has been cited by journalists and scholars um, across the globe. 
So uh, with that, uh, let's go to the inter introduction of our panelists and then we'll dive uh, right into the questions. Uh, uh, we have a somewhat limited time this morning, uh, so, so, but we'll try to get uh, to questions that you post in the Q&A as well. So now introducing our panel, uh, Sadie Babbitts is a professor and the sustainability director at the Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. She's also the president of the Society of Environmental Journalists, which counts more than 1,400 uh, journalist members and academics in 46 countries. Good morning, Sadie. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, Jennifer Lawless is the Commonwealth Professor of Politics and Public Policy at the University of Virginia, and she's the co-author of the new book, News Hole, uh, The Demise of Local Journalism and Political Engagement. Jen, it's great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Daisuke Nakai is the New York Bureau Chief of Ashai Shimbun, uh, one of Japan's largest news organizations. Good morning, Daisuke. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Rasmus Nielsen is the director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism and professor of political communication at the University of Oxford. Good morning, Rasmus. Or good afternoon, I should say, in your case. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, and Glenn Smith uh, is the editor of the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, watchdog and public service team at the Charleston Post and Courier. Good morning, Glenn. Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. Thanks to all of you uh, for being with us this morning. So uh, we're, we're going to dive uh, right into the questions. Uh, uh, Penny and I will be taking turns uh, uh, asking the questions this morning. Um, Rasmus, let's start with you. From your perch uh, leading the Reuters Institute at Oxford, uh, you're uniquely positioned to see uh, the local news landscape globally. What's your assessment of the state of local news and how does the situation in the U.S. compare to Europe and other parts of the globe? Well, I mean, I think there are some uh, reasons for sort of fact-based hope. Uh, I mean, we are seeing some important initiatives in nonprofit uh, local journalism. We are seeing citizens bear witness to things that even at the height of their commercial success, local newspapers often ignored, such as police violence. So I think there are some encouraging developments, but it's also clear that commercial local journalism is facing very serious uh, challenges. The business model of the local print newspapers is bust, is going on in one way. Uh, and of course, that uh, funded the majority of investment in uh, local commercial journalism uh, in much of the world, particularly in the United States. In some ways, uh, what we are seeing in the United States now is also a decline from a particularly sort of uh, lucrative commercial perch. There are very few of any countries in the world where local newspapers were as large or as profitable as they were in the United States. In that sense, what we're seeing in the US is the approximation to more towards what one could think of sort of the global mean, where local news is not particularly commercially profitable, not particularly robust, and not particularly comprehensive. Uh, so if you want a sort of a sense of what that might look like in the future, perhaps a sort of a trip to sort of Spain or Italy uh, or Portugal or other examples of high income democracies where local news has never been as lucrative um, and never been as robust as it was in the United States for half a century. Um, is it your view, um, Rasmus, that the pandemic has deepened the financial crisis confronting local news organizations and that in the US, for example, there's evidence of a steep decline in advertising revenue, um, and you were referencing advertising uh, and, and its support for local journalism. Um, at the same time, though, there's been a surge in digital subscriptions and in readership because of the pandemic, since the pandemic. How do those trends uh, affect the bottom line for news organizations? I mean, I think the simplest way to summarize it is few winners and many losers. Uh, those news organizations that have been most successful in convincing readers that they are distinct and valuable enough that people want to pay for them, uh, either as a commercial transaction through a subscription or as a form of support with a membership or donation model. Uh, a number of those have come out stronger, uh, even from a very severe cyclical crisis uh, during the pandemic. Uh, but most news organizations are not like that. Uh, most news organizations are quite heavily reliant on advertising still. Um, in addition to the cyclical dip of, of advertising during phases of the pandemic, of course, more broadly, the pandemic has accelerated the move to a more digital, mobile, and platform-dominated media environment where people have sort of realized how much they can do with their smartphone um, and how many of the services and products offered by big platform companies are quite compelling. Uh, 
And in the process of that, even more attention, even more opportunities to collect data. And as a consequence, even more advertising is flowing to a limited number of large platform companies, very seriously challenging uh, the business model of those news organizations who are still primarily in the business of selling their audiences attention to advertisers, because frankly, they aren't really competitive uh, in that market. They can't compete with the scale, they can't compete with the price points, and they can't compete with the database targeting that platforms offer. So they struggle. Um, so it's really grim, I think, for a lot of titles out there. Um, and I suspect it's going to get worse before it gets better for quite a lot of titles, uh, even as, as I wanted to stress, there are also green shoots uh, of news organizations that are doing really important reporting and also some that are doing reasonably well financially. Um, what, what, are, what are those green shoots that you see, Rasmus? Well, I mean, I, I think we are seeing, uh, you know, individual titles also sometimes at the local level who are building up a subscriber basis. This is winning hearts and minds one at a time. People have uh, an enormous amount of uh, information available for free online. And if you are to convince them to pay for what you offer, it really has to be distinct. We are seeing some titles doing reasonably well in that space uh, in, uh, in the Twin Cities areas in the US, in Boston um, are a few examples of US titles, but also in some parts of Europe, we're seeing this with individual titles. Um, for example, in Norway, where uh, local newspapers are doing quite well, actually, in terms of subscriptions in some parts of Germany um, as well. What they have in common is that um, they have a very clear and strong uh, value proposition, um, that they are sort of clearly differentiated from all the sort of generic information one can find online and on social media, and that they have been very focused in their execution and kept sort of confident that if their journalism was good enough and if their product uh, was good enough and the price point reasonable, then over time they would be able to convince a growing number of people to pay, even if it wouldn't quote unquote replace the money that had been made in print, because of course nothing will. Um, right. And instead the focus there I think is on value creation looking forward rather than sort of sentimental longing for a business model that's bust. I that's great. Thank you for those examples. Um, a couple more quick questions, and, and, and then we're going to move around the horn here. Um, in the U.S., uh, we've seen hedge funds significantly increase their ownership of major local news publishing companies uh, just this year. Uh, for example, Alden Global Capital, known for its aggressive cost cutting, uh, acquired Tribune Publishing back in May. Um, of course, Tribune Publishing owns the Chicago Tribune and the Baltimore Sun, among others. Um, Alden now is attempting to take over Lee Enterprises, which reaches 77 markets in 26 states. Um, hedge fund also hold uh, ownership stakes um, in major publishers like Gannett and McClatchy. What, what do you think are the implications of this hedge fund ownership? Well, I mean, I think that uh, journalism is facing a sort of a challenging transitional period. And I think we have to expect that this, this will be difficult for some time to come. I don't, I don't see a sort of a, an equilibrium in the, in the short term future. I think it's going to be quite an uncertain period for some time to come. I think in that environment, uh, people who care about the profession of journalism and the role it plays in our societies, I think would wanna look for investors who have a long-term perspective and are content with uh, limited returns in the short run. Uh, that's not normally how hedge funds or private e equity investors operate. Um, they are often interested in, for example, asset stripping, uh, buying things up primarily to sell off, for example, real estate. Uh, or for that matter, they um, might treat entities that they buy up as cash cows because they have debt that they need to service and thus need the cash flow, which still exists in a lot of newspapers. And of course, if one is ruthless enough in the cost cutting, it can be treated sort of as a West Texas oil field that you sort of pump dry as cheaply as you can and then you shut it up when you're done. Um, so, you know, uh, perhaps some hedge funds and private equity firms are different uh, from that scenario, which of course is not one that journalists or citizens uh, can look at with any particular uh, um, sort of happiness, despite whatever investors may feel about it. Um, but if they are different, we should judge them by their actions. Uh, so, you know, if they invest uh, in journalism uh, and if they demonstrate innovation, uh, new forms of editorial content, new business models and deliver growth, um, then that would be very interesting to see. Um, I can't off the top of my head think of many examples of hedge funds or, or private equity firms who have uh, delivered on that. Right. Um, Rasmus, when we interviewed you a few weeks ago, you noted that local news takes up only about 0.5% of Americans' total internet time, and even less in Europe, 0.3%. Do you attribute that uh, to a lack of local news coverage or to a lack of interest? 
In other words, does local news have a supply problem or a demand problem or both? Um, I mean, I can understand, you know, I'm an academic and God knows, you know, we can be sort of quite sort of sniffy about uh, people as well. And I understand sometimes that, you know, journalists might feel frustrated with what they perceive to be sort of a fickle public, if you will. I would say that whether one is an academic or a journalist, uh, you know, you serve the public you have, not the public that you might want or the public that will be more lucrative for your profession and your institutions. So I, I don't want to think about demand problems. I don't think that's a useful way of going about it. And it's not it's certainly not a very sort of um, constructive from a business point of view either. Uh, supply, I think, is an issue. I mean, there are communities in which by now local news is so thin and so commodified that you can't really blame people for not paying a lot of attention to it. Uh, I just took a glance at a you know, local newspaper in the UK that shall remain on the name before we start this conversation. The top seven units are first, join our Facebook group for nostalgics of our local community. Uh, second, an ad. Then two live blogs of a local murder trial, a story about a lonely dog, another ad. And then at the bottom of the top seven units, a story about a local strike. So there is some public interest journalism here, but perhaps not enough to sort of compel people uh, to really see this as distinct from just stuff on the internet. Um, I mean, I suppose the way that uh, business people would think about this is sort of product market fit. Uh, what is it that local journalism does um, that, that doesn't take the form of, of sort of just saying that it's valuable, but actually convincing people that it's valuable? There are lots of things that societies need but anyone who has paid even just passing attention to human history will know that most things societies need, they never get. Um, if, if society just needing things was enough, then there would be vibrant local journalism all across you know, the world. Um, but, but that clearly isn't the case. We have to be more clear-eyed about this. You'll miss us when, you're when we're gone is not a business model. Um, and I think it really is about being very clear-eyed about how journalism can help people in their lives by providing them with information that they either want to have or need to have. And right now, I think we need to recognize that much of what local news offered historically is frankly offered in more convenient and compelling formats by others. Uh, and, and that requires, I think, quite a radical rethink of what it is that makes local journalism distinct. Um, and then really sort of focusing on uh, marketing that distinct value of genuinely distinct, informative, local accountability reporting and useful information uh, and packaging in a way that's compelling digitally and convincing people to pay for it. That's hard. It's easy for me to sit in, an, in an, a nice office in Oxford and tell people how to do their jobs. Uh, but I will say, I think we are seeing some examples of this happening. And I think we really need to sort of seize onto that as an inspiration. Uh, this can be done, not in the sense of keeping shareholders and investors happy or making the same kind of money that was made in the 1990s, but that's not the definition of success from a journalistic point of view or from, from a public interest point of view. The definition of success there is sustainable, independent, professional reporting also in local communities that can inform the public and hold power to account. And I think we are seeing some inter interesting and important and inspiring examples of that. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Penny, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Um, Jen, uh, I want to uh, pick up on what uh, Rasmus was just talking about with uh, demand, but I want to preface it by saying uh, your book, News Hold, really addresses both the supply issue and some thoughts about how hard it's going to be to convince people uh, to uh, increase their demand for that. And I, we start with the whole notion that journalism has historically been considered a public good in a democracy. So even if everybody doesn't get local news, the people that do get it and then use that information to vote uh, is uh, we benefit as a society. So in your book, you found out on the supply side uh, that uh, there's a correlation between the loss of local news and the loss of voter participation. In fact, a very uh, alarming correlation between the two over the last two decades. But you also found something interesting in terms of demand as you were doing a survey. Would you mind tell us what you found in terms of uh, what might make people uh, decide they really need to focus on the loss of local news? Sure. So you're right. The book focuses on the decline in the content and volume of local news over the course of the last 20 years. And as local news has declined in communities across the United States, we've seen declines not only in voter uh, turnout, but also in political knowledge at the local level. So people now have less information about their mayors, their school boards, their city councils. The good news is that while there's been a ton of attention on the supply side and figuring out ways to incentivize 
reporters and publishers and journalists to figure out how to package and promote a good that voter, uh, you know, that citizens would want. We found that there actually is a willingness on the part of citizens to up their demand. It's just that they're not thinking about local news as much as they're thinking about national news. They're not thinking about local political information as vital to being informed citizens. But when they're reminded of that, they're actually far more likely to say, oh yeah, maybe I would actually be interested in subscribing to a local paper. And we, we found this through a series of surveys and experiments, but let me just highlight one that I think is pretty indicative of the overall results. We conducted two exit polls. So one was in 2018 uh, on election day in Arlington, Virginia. So that's right outside of Washington, DC. It was the midterm elections. And then we did another one in 2019 in Charlottesville, Virginia, which was Virginia has off year elections. So that was a state legislative election. So these are both pretty low turnout affairs, although 2018 had higher than usual turnout for a midterm election. And as voters were coming out of the polling place, we asked them to fill out a quick survey. We asked them basic demographic information, who they voted for, but then we embedded an experiment right at the end. And there was a sentence at the bottom of the, sur the survey, the questionnaire that we handed people, that said, would you be interested in subscribing to either Arlington Now or The Daily Progress, two online news sources, to get more information about local news? And if they said yes, we asked them to provide their email address. The experiment was that a third of the people just got that one question, would you be willing? Another third received a sentence before that question that said, local news is, a, lo local political information is important for being an informed citizen. Would you be willing to subscribe? And then we also, had another treatment that said, it's important to be informed about what's going on in your community. And what we found was that one simple sentence was enough to increase the likelihood that people would give us their email addresses substantially. We actually saw, excuse me, about a seven to eight percentage point increase in the likelihood that somebody would tell us that yes, they were interested in subscribing and that we could you know, sort of submit their name and that they would get this local digest of news. And what that suggests to us is that when people are primed to think about local news as an ingredient for being a good citizen, or when they're primed to think about local news as an ingredient for being informed about what's going on in their community, for being a more informed voter, for example, they're willing to say, yeah, I'd like to actually get that content. I'd like to know what's going on. It's just that they're not thinking about it. So the same way that there are marketing campaigns for other public goods, we suggest that we might benefit from a marketing campaign for local news and reminding people out there that this is important and it's important to them. The one point that I'll add just to sum up is that there's no question. We also asked on a variety of surveys whether you think that local versus national news is entertaining or boring, important or interesting. And people definitely think that local news is more boring than national news. They certainly believe that it's not as entertaining, that it's not as interesting. But when it came to questions about importance and relevance, we didn't really see big distinctions there. So people do know that it's important and relevant. They're just not thinking about their local newspaper as a place to get that information. And what you found also correlates with what Pew has found uh, uh, when it asked people, are you aware, are you getting the local news you need? And more than half of people said no, they noticed uh, that it had declined. I want to flip back over to the supply side right now and read two statements that set off alarm bells or should have for anyone who cares about this democracy. It says residents in cities and counties across the U.S now have access to less coverage of local government than at any time in modern American history, as the potential for new sources of local news, such as internet startups, remain uncertain, and that does remain uncertain. We're losing about as many internet uh, startups as we have here, as we uh, uh, found or organized here in the US. As the potential for new sources of news remains uncertain, the prospect of an un unprecedented information crisis looms on the local horizon. So what can be done on the supply side uh, on this? Are, are you simply sounding the alarm bell to say we need to look at this and understand what the implications are for democracy? Mostly the latter. We're sounding the alarm bell. But one thing that we do show is that 
alternative news sources aren't stepping in to save the day. And so we've seen this precipitous decline in terms of local print journalism. And initially people thought, well, maybe TV is fixing this problem, right? We haven't seen a major decline in local TV audiences. Maybe they're just upping their overall amount of local news content. And at the end of the day, it's just gonna be a shift in terms of where people should go to get this information. But we also tracked local news coverage in dozens of media markets across the country to see if they, over time, have been more likely to cover the school board, the city council, mayors. And we basically saw flat lines. So it, while it's true that local TV has maintained its position as providing some degree of coverage, they certainly haven't upped their coverage as local print journalism has declined. Similarly, we found the same thing, as you just mentioned, when it came to local internet startups. Some are wildly successful, many are not. They're often short-lived. The amount of political content at the local level is very varied. And more often than not, they're concentrated in large cities that actually already have other local news sources. So it's becoming increasingly likely that a consumer who wants access to local political information is having a very tough time getting it. And the irony, of course, is that it's now easier than ever before to get information about local politics. I'm sorry, about national politics. But as it becomes easier and easier to become a national political junkie, even if you're interested in local news, it's becoming harder and harder to get that information. So I'd ask you to just kind of sum up, what are the implications for government accountability and oversight if these trends continue? It's not good. Um, I mean, that's basically the way I'd summarize it. Very, very bad for a couple of reasons. The first is if people don't have information about what's going on in city hall, what's going on in school boards, what's going on at their county legislature, it's very difficult to hold elected officials accountable. And there have been studies that have shown when there's less accountability, there's more corruption. Moreover, when you don't know what's going on with your local elected officials and you don't have a lot of information about what's going on election time, it makes it very easy for incumbents to get reelected and even to run unopposed. Without electoral competition, it's very tricky as well to hold elected officials accountable. And then finally, it's particularly concerning because we've reached a point in US politics now where more and more policy decisions have devolved to the local level. Federalism has always meant that there are certain decisions that are made at the local versus the state national level. But what we have seen over the last decade, and COVID is a perfect example of this, is increasing um, responsibility to handle local crises, including public health pandemics, to local elected officials. Well, these officials are not being kept in check by their constituents, largely because those constituents don't have information. And that really threatens the quality of representation as well. Thank you, Jen. I'm going to turn it back over to Tim. Thanks, Penny. Thanks, Jen. Uh, so, Glenn, uh, let's talk about the uh, real world on the ground ripple effects uh, of the decline of local news on government accountability. Uh, in, in launching your uh, terrific uh, groundbreaking uh, uncovered investigation um, uh, in South Carolina, the Post and Courier uh, wrote the following. I'm going to quote from it briefly. Uh, quote, corruption is flourishing in the rural corners of South Carolina as newspapers fold or shrink amid a financially crippling pandemic, uh, close quote. Now, at the time that was written, seven of the state's newspapers had closed in a year. Was it those closures that spurred your project? Um, and could you please describe the collaborative effort uh, involving more than, or involving 16 news outlets um, that made the Uncovered Investigative Series possible? Sure. Uh, it, it, it did in part, but not directly at first. Uh, this goes back a few years ago. Uh, we started investigating a prosecutor who was siphoning off money from his office to support lavish travel and big parties and all sorts of things that had nothing to do with prosecuting criminals. Uh, he ended up going to prison for that. Out of that, uh, we got a number of tips that led us to judges and, and a lot of sheriffs around the state who had been abusing their offices, uh, misusing money, uh, doing all sorts of, of bad things. And we started to notice a pattern there and that a lot of these things were happening in rural areas, particularly rural areas that did not have a strong news presence. Uh, some had lost newspapers altogether. Uh, some had papers that were just barely hanging on. Some had some very good little newspapers that were working really hard and exposing some stuff, but they were up against a lot, one and two person shops. 
So we started thinking, wonder what else is out there in these rural areas that we don't know about. We should really investigate. But we didn't know. We had, we had the resources. We had the manpower. But we didn't have a whole lot of institutional knowledge of those areas. We didn't know a lot about the people, the network of sources, uh, the, the history. So we came up with this idea of reaching out to community newspapers in that area and in those areas and asking if they wanted to partner with us. Uh, give us your tips. Uh, tell us, you know, what you think. What's that story that you always wanted to go after? What are these suspicions that you've had, but maybe didn't have the money or the manpower to do? Now, at first, some of these newspapers were like, "What's this? You know, we're, we're the largest newspaper in the state," and people were looking at us like, "What's the hitch here? What's the catch?" And we said, "There, there isn't one. It's a very flexible model. We're not ask, asking you to spend uh, any money at all, really." Uh, you can give us our tips. We can investigate them, produce stories that you can run. We could partner with you on stories and co-report them and co-write them. Uh, we can go through and, and come up with some findings. You can do stories your own. And, uh, you know, if, if FOIA costs are an issue, uh, we had set up an investigative fund with donations from the community that we were surprised by just the absolute amount of money that was coming in on that from people who did support this sort of local journal accountability journalism. Uh, so we set up this thing and we had uh, 16 different news outlets, uh, pretty much every corner of the state. And uh, it's, it's just been amazing. We've produced over 40 stories to date. We've exposed a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, we've helped expand our coverage, provide our readers with, with more, uh, interesting stuff from around the state. And we've helped support these local newspapers and give them original content and let their readers know the value of having those operations within those communities. Now, uh, Glenn, you touched on this a little bit, but I'd like to go into some more detail. Sure. Um, so, so, so many of us who closely follow the state of local news um, are very concerned about the lack of government accountability reporting in rural parts of the country. Um, your project, really starkly illustrated uh, the manifestation of those concerns. Um, could you give us one example of what you found uh, that might otherwise have gone unreported? Yeah, so uh, I, I, you know, there's, there's a number of them. There's like the, the school superintendent who was living rent-free in a condo that the taxpayers bought uh, to recruit teachers. There, there was the uh, town councilman who had a no-bid contract that was sending thousands of dollars to uh, in, in medical bills to his practice. Uh, but the one that really stands out for me, there, there's a community that's about 45 minutes north of uh, Columbia, our, our state capital. And the editor there at this, this small paper, she is a dynamo, a very aggressive, uh, assertive journalist uh, who is operating on a shoestring. Um, she doesn't take a salary and often pays the rent for the papers building out of her own pocket if there's not enough money to come in. But she's done some amazing stuff. She came to us and had a lot of concerns about a school superintendent in that area who had a large uh, discretionary fund. Nobody could even really pin down how much this guy was making. They, we knew he was among the highest paid superintendents in the state, but he wouldn't tell people even on his own school board. He said, you have to submit a FOIA or take a formal vote. So he's got like 40, 50 grand in this discretionary fund and we knew he'd taken, uh, gone on trips to uh, far off places. And so this uh, editor, Barbara Ball, she's foia'd uh, for uh, his discretionary fund accounts. And he said, okay, it's gonna cost you $340. Barbara didn't have $340. Everything is so tight there that she just couldn't do it. So she was sort of stuck in her tracks. So we came in, provided her with a couple reporters, offered to pay the FOIA bill and went after those, uh, those records. And they showed that he was traveling out of state with students and spending on things, bringing in uh, dance instructors for like $10,000 in, in uh, taxpayer money, um, exposed a whole bunch of stuff that even school board members couldn't get their hand on. And I know that this was something that Barbara had worked on for years and to be able to help her to bring that to light was just amazing. Yeah, th that, that is amazing. So, um... In the past, Glenn, as you know well, uh, news outlets have been competitors, not collaborators. Uh, given the state of local news now, do you see collaborations like yours in South Carolina happening elsewhere in the U.S.? Um, and if so, do you think they could help fill some of this void of investigative journalism? 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's the, you know, the be all end all answer to everything, but I think it absolutely could be. We've had some calls from uh, papers in other states that were interested in replicating our model. Um, and, you know, we've partnered in the past with, with places like ProPublica and the Center for Public Integrity and the Center for Investigative Reporting. And that's helped boost our uh, ability to do some stories. So I, I definitely think so. I think the old model where everybody's sort of hoarding everything for themselves. I mean, the, this is just a win for both sides tremendously. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, Penny, back back to you. Thank you. Uh, Dasuki, I, um, you know, many newspapers in uh, Japan, uh, national newspapers such as you still have millions of subscribers. Uh, some regional newspapers actually have millions of subscribers. And I remember reading a statistic somewhere around 10 years ago that the average adult in Japan read three newspapers a day. So um, it's easy to look at things from this um, uh, perspective in the US and say Japan has figured it out. Uh, give us a perspective in Japan. How is it different from the US and um, what do you see as the areas of concern and also uh, perhaps um, opportunities for Japanese uh, press? Sure, um, to sort of start out, um, I'll quickly go over how the Japanese newspaper industry sort of um, is at the moment uh, where there's five or six national newspapers, including us, which cover most of Japan. Um, and then each prefecture usually has at least one local newspaper, which will cover that prefecture's news. And then there's some smaller local papers that um, operate on a smaller area of a certain city or a certain part of a prefecture. And those are not always a given. Um, there's always going to be some professional newspapers, but um, the smaller ones are not always there. And so um, as a whole, the newspaper industry in Japan as well has been in a decline. Um, the numbers, I just have a moment right now, for instance, in 2008, um, close to 90% of the population, adult population said that they um, subscribe to a newspaper. Now that's down to about 60%. So it's about gone down about 30% over the past 15 years or so. Um, one big thing that's been different from the US is that the US industry, newspaper industry was always very um, driven by ad revenue as compo compared to um, circulation revenue. I think the figures traditionally given in the US was about 70 to 80% of ad revenue and 20 to 30% of circulation revenue. Um, in Japan, it's been more 50-50, or it used to be at least 50-50, which meant that when the ad revenue dried up in around 2010 or so, um, the newspaper industry in Japan was still in a better situation than the US. On the other hand, um, circulation is sort of a long-term decline right now, which means that um, in the long term, we are facing sort of gleam gloomier and gloomier in prospects. Uh, originally, there wasn't the cliff that sort of fell off in the US, but the sort of more long downward spiral right now. That being said, um, looking at the statistics, it's actually local newspapers that are sort of doing better at the moment. Um, the drop off has been mostly in national newspapers, local newspapers, although um, the, news, the numbers were never that high to begin with, have been sort of keeping their heads above water. Um, so that is a good point. But again, um, with the sort of long downward trend, I don't see that there's very much good things going on at the moment. The other thing that has to be mentioned is that no local newspaper that I know of in Japan has really been able to do a sort of breakthrough on the digital side. It's really, really still connected to the print industry. And so there again, um, once the generation that's used to getting their physical newspaper gradually is gone, um, what happens after that is a big question that nobody really has an answer to right now. Uh, let me uh, switch gears just a minute and talk about the, the big global story that's also a local story. Uh, there's really no bigger story in the world right now than COVID. Uh, the percentage of uh, those fully vaccinated in Japan is 77% compared to 60, almost 60 in the U.S. Uh, there are many reasons for the difference, but what role do you think local news organizations in Japan have played in the higher vaccination rates and lower death rates? One thing that's really striking about 
COVID in the U.S. is how much every issue has been a political issue, whether it's masks or vaccines or keeping people out of um, crowded spaces. And that really hasn't been an issue um, in other countries, including Japan. And um, to a certain degree, I do think that just because there are fewer local news organizations in the US that are covering this type of issue, it becomes easier and easier for every single issue to be nationally politicized and polarized. Um, and unfortunately, vaccines seem to have fallen into that sort of basket of um, issues that are very, very nationalized and politicized. So although, um, I wouldn't say that any certain type of coverage of local news has made a difference. Maybe the, that is a factor that the very existence or lack of existence of local news has sort of led into that um, general environment in which it becomes harder to get people to get convinced to be vaccinated. Uh, let me just follow up on that and talk about um not only uh, the political aspect, but also just the, the sheer uh, uh, quantity and quality of content. How would you compare local coverage of the pandemic in Asian markets and in, in Japan specifically, uh, some of the issues you might have confronted that were not necessarily ones here in the US, but how would you compare in general the quantity and quality of uh, local coverage of the pandemic versus uh, US? That's a difficult question. Um... Concerning Japan, one um, thing that should be sort of has to be mentioned is that a lot of the pandemic itself was in more larger metropolitan areas. You never really had um, in the rural parts of the country the same type of situation that's been happening in, for instance, parts of the US. But that again may just go back to the fact that it's become such a national issue in the US that um, it's harder to follow on, in, this is sort of the next question as well, but it's sort of hard to follow what's been happening in each location when it's such a big story. And compared to that, um, for instance, in Japan, we've been following very closely what the Tokyo Metropolitan Government has been doing, just because there were so many cases in Tokyo. Um, obviously in a place, for instance, like New York in the United States as well, that um, New York had many of the cases at the beginning of the pandemic, and there was a lot of coverage there, but um, I don't know if that similar type of coverage of each metropolitan area has continued in the US. And one last question, um, look, look across the Asian landscape in terms of covering a global story like the pandemic, uh, are there any areas that really concern you? Uh, for instance, Hong Kong is, uh, and the future of the press, free press in Hong Kong. Well, Hong Kong, obviously, um, that is without the, even the pandemic happening, obviously what is happening there is a concern for a free press. Um, it's harder and harder to get news out of Hong Kong and um, news organizations are actually moving out of Hong Kong just because they can't keep their safety and um, or they can't assume that the level that, of freedom that they had in the past will continue. But I think one really bigger issue is China as a whole, where you have fewer and fewer reporters reporting out of China. It used to always be that um, even if the Chinese news services themselves were not always, um, did not have all the coverage that you would hope for, there was a lot of particularly English news coverage coming out of China. But now post pandemic, it's harder and harder to get around in China. There's more and more scrutiny and um, if we just look at, for instance, we still don't really know what happened in the early days in Wuhan, and it's really, really hard to access that as well. So that going forward, I think is worrying. Um, yes, now, and I think that's going to be more and more worrying going forward. Okay, Tim. Okay, um, well, uh, last but certainly not least, Sadie. Um, uh, Another huge global story with very local effects is climate change. Um, as president of the Society of Environmental Journalists um, and in your role at Arizona State, you pay close attention to environmental coverage. Uh, given the diminishment of local newsrooms uh, and the justifiable attention focused on the pandemic, have you seen a decline in coverage of climate change over the past year or so? Well, 
Absolutely, Tim. You know, I, I think with here in the U.S. in particular, local newsrooms had a triple whammy. So you had the pandemic, you had an election, and you also had the murder of George Floyd and tremendous social unrest across the country. And for local newsrooms and even large newsrooms too, everyone was scrambling on how to cover these incredibly pressing issues. And so from my purge, climate change took a bit of a backseat as it, as it probably should have, even though that obviously that's continuing on. So climate change coverage, I think, definitely slid back a little bit uh, during the, the pandemic. I think lo local newsrooms had to be very, very selective of how they were going to cover stories. I, a great example of this is the Navajo Times on the Navajo Nation. You know, it's a small staffed newspaper. Uh, they obviously COVID hit the Navajo Nation very hard. Their environmental reporter, who also did climate coverage, uh, had to pivot and continues to pivot to this day and is, is having to do even more with less staff now coming you know, sort of out of the pandemic. We're obviously still carrying on with that. It's interesting though, because climate change coverage is now I think escalating. And part of that has to do with COP26. So right. we saw a lot of coverage happening uh, in the lead up to COP26 with the United Nations gathering of nations. Um, and now we're starting to, we're still seeing climate change coverage, but it's it's back down a little bit. So it's definitely a, more of a steady beat, but not as uh, such of a frenzy as we led up to COP26. Uh, it's really interesting, just in a, in a quick Google search this morning, uh, looking at climate change coverage, you know, all the big outlets, you know, every everyone from like BBC to Bloomberg to the New York Times to the Washington Post, had a climate change story that came out a couple of days ago, um, but there isn't as much recent stuff hitting today. So I think that's also indicative of where interest is is right now with with climate change coverage. Yeah. Now, one thing that I think a number of us worry about um, is climate change coverage not reaching. Uh, many of the people who could be the most affected. Um, Penny has done incredible research on the growing number of news deserts um, across uh, the United States. Um, so A, I guess, do you see that happening? And B, what are the implications uh, for people who live in coastal communities or areas ravaged by wildfire if they're, they don't have access to local news and information about what's happening in their areas? I think the dangers are real. I mean, in a recent uh, research report from uh, Yale Program on Climate Change Communication last year, uh, showed that 78% of Americans are interested in stories about global warming in their local communities. I think that statistic says a lot about the importance of local news and covering climate. Uh, the problem is we do have news deserts, and it's very difficult to get that information out there, especially when you, you're a small newsroom and you're trying to cover all of the, th the things that are happening in our world. So it, it is a, it's a huge problem. I mean, uh, interestingly enough, today, in my little climate change search uh, on, on Google, the Palm Beach Post had a story about the rise of, of sea levels and what that means for flooding and how to mitigate that. Um, we don't see a lot of that coming out of local newsrooms, especially from the newspaper world. Uh, interestingly, my background is public radio, and so I've I've been fortunate to be in that space and see that this this whole conversation of local news a little bit differently because uh, public radio newsrooms have had to collaborate uh, to try and get some of this coverage and also try and pick up some of, of what has been lost from local newspapers as the demise of the traditional newspaper has has continued. So without local news focused on covering issues like climate change, that information isn't getting there. And so communities who are trying to stay connected and, and possibly focusing on solutions to a, a huge problem, that disconnect is happening. And I, I think it's a huge void and something that we have to solve. Well, and, and, and you just alluded uh, to something that, that is my next question, which is, uh, should we be seeing more focus of coverage on things like mitigation and solutions uh, to rising sea levels and, and to the other effects of climate change? I know you're doing some of that yourself uh, in your work at Arizona State. Could you talk about that? 
Absolutely. I, I think this is where climate change coverage has to pivot to because we know global warming is happening. We know what's behind it. We know what needs to be done. There's the science, it's, it's there. Um, unfortunately, we have a lot of misinformation, which we as journalists have to continue to combat and to help educate. Again, going back to the importance of why this is so important for local newsrooms to cover and have the resources and ability to cover this. Um, I think we have to pivot to this idea of solutions for climate change or even responses. So how do communities such as like in Palm Beach, Florida, like how are they coming together and sharing that conversation through their local local paper or their local public radio station or their local TV station or a digital platform? How are they coming together to solve that? And the more that we can do that style of reporting, I think we start to move the needle if, if everyone can, can get into that space, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it, it, it absolutely does. And I'm, I'm with you completely on that. Um, so, so uh, we're now going to open it up to to uh, uh, some other questions, and we've gotten a couple of questions that have come in uh, through the Q and A. Um, uh, so, so I would invite any of our participants to please feel free to type questions um, into the Q and A, uh, and we're probably going to go about five or ten minutes long, so we can get to as many questions as possible um, uh, that that you might have. Um, Rasmus, before before we turn to the questions that are that are in the queue, um, I'd be curious what, what you've heard today uh, from our um, August panelists uh, and through your work at the Reuters Institute. Have you heard of any paths forward for local news? Um, any innovations that that you'd like to share? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I think that the examples offered, uh, for example, by Glenn and some of the local environmental reporting that Sadie highlights are real examples of, you know, innovation and new ideas and inspirations that come from journalists, uh, which I think we can all draw courage from. And Faust Jan's work illustrates the importance uh, of finding ways ahead on this. Um, I mean, I suppose that uh, I think the probably the single most important thing uh, from my point of view as an analyst is to um, you know, embrace the idea that a profession that seeks truth and report it ought to be willing to take its own medicine um, and to be realistic about, you know, what are the prospects and plan from that rather than from what uh, we might want to be the case. Um, and if we do that, I think we need to accept that there is a picture that's been holding us captive, which is sort of a romanticized ideal of what a sort of 20th century American newspaper was, which some of them were great some of the time or much of the time, but not all of them were great. Um, and, you know, I think we need to sort of reckon with that and think about how can we make the best use of the resources we have going forward. And I'm very encouraged by some of the examples we've heard about today of eliminating competitive waste and, and putting the, the admittedly scarce, but nonetheless real resources to better use. Um, and I have a, a lot of faith in, in journalists' uh, ability to lead the way on that. Uh, is there a role for others to, to, to help with this transition? I think there is. I mean, I'd like to think that researchers can, can help inform decision making in this space and in conversations about this, but it's up to journalists and citizens to make their own decisions. Uh, of course, there are policy options. I mean, in, in some countries in Europe, uh, very tangible commitments of public resources enable independent professional journalism, both in the private sector, nonprofit sector, and public service media. But that's a purely political question, whether we believe that that is the right decision to take in a society. And of course, in some societies, we may not trust that the politicians who would take those decisions, in fact, have the best interests of independent professional journalism, let alone the public at heart. And they may have other ulterior motives uh, if they offer up support. Uh, but I mean, I, I think we are seeing, uh, you know, a, a fair, you know, a, a really encouraging examples of innovation that takes nothing away from the challenges and it will be tough. Uh, and I think we will continue to see news from shrink in many places. Um, people will lose their jobs, communities will be poorly served. Um, but I think we should sort of recognize the privileges in those parts of the world where journalists can at least report freely, where we had sort of a good run for half a century, not a perfect one, but a good run, and have a lot to build on, if you will. And I would say, you know, if, you know, if African-American journalists could, uh, you know, cover Jim Crow and the, and the sort of the, the American South, or for that matter, some of the big cities in the North, uh, if you know, if, if, uh, if resistance fighters in Europe could publish newspapers doing Nazi occupations, uh, if, if, if we see, you know, Maria Ressa and other beacons of, of innovation and commitment to editorial uh, values uh, do their very difficult and challenging work around the, 
the world. I'm pretty confident that, that if we try to, we will find ways ahead in Oxford and New York um, uh, as well, if people have, have, have been able to find so under on a more even more challenging circumstances. So I, I think we need to be serious about the challenges, but they're very real and very severe. But I think there are also reasons for fact-based optimism um, and, and just a recognition that journalism plays an incredibly important role in many parts of the world without having had the privileges or level of resource that uh, large metro papers in the US had for half a century. Um, great, thank you. So, so uh, we're, we're almost at the top of the hour. So, so I, I, and we are getting some questions that are coming into the Q&A that I'd like to get to. So I'll, I'll open these up to the entire group. So please feel free, uh, anybody to jump in um, on any of these. Uh, the, the first question is, uh, uh, and Rasmus, you were just referring uh, to this topic. Uh, what are some public policy solutions that you think states states should explore to help strengthen uh, local and ethnic media? Anybody want to tackle that? Of course, right now, uh, the U.S. House has passed uh, tax credits for uh, uh, the, the hiring of local journalists that that is now pending in the Senate. It's part of the Build Back Better um, uh, proposal uh, from the administration. But any thoughts on what the states might be able to do from a public policy perspective? I mean, I could be the very European okay. and, and say a few things. Okay. I mean, you know, we, we use our states for more than waging war. Um, so, um, I mean, I suppose there are sort of uh, four basic instruments available. Uh, you can um, invest uh, public funds uh, in uh, journalism produced by for-profit private companies. This is normally done through VHC exemptions and other forms of tax benefits, uh, which I know have been considered in the US as well now, or through direct subsidies tied to actual investment in editorial, so that you're not simply subsidizing uh, the profit margin of private companies or what they spend uh, on you know, trucks and trees and, and real estate, but on actual journalism. Uh, secondly, uh, you can create a more enabling environment for nonprofit journalism. Here is, I think, a rare example where the U.S. set the best in class in terms of uh, the combination of how easy, relatively easy it is to create nonprofit news organizations and the tax benefit that accrue to those who support them. Of course, we have both newer nonprofits as well as long standing traditional public media in the United States, which I think the rest of the world can look at with admiration. Third, the sort of the locus classico, which uh, Yasuke knows well from Japan, and that's relatively common in Northwestern Europe and, and some parts of the rest of the world is public service media, a serious commitment of very real financial resources to independent uh, public service media that operates at arm's length from government. Um, and of course, fourth, uh, you know, governments can make it easier and cheaper to do independent uh, reporting. Uh, through open data, uh, greater transparency, uh, ease of FOIA requests and the like. And I think if we look at the last record, we can just sort of judge, if you will, the genuine commitment of politicians and governments to journalism by whether they in fact release data in machine readable formats or in poorly scanned PDFs and the like. I mean, if they aren't at least making it easy and cheap to do journalism, then that gives us a sense of sort of what the level of commitment is. And above and beyond, as I said, is a purely political question, whether as a society, we want to commit additional resource uh, to support uh, and enable independent professional journalism, but there are options. Um, and, and if we don't choose to pursue those options, that's because uh, our politicians or the public at large do not believe that we should invest public resources. There are our options and we should confront this and then we can make decisions as a society as to whether we want to use them. Can I just chime yeah. in quickly? Yes. The yes. challenge yes. in the United States, I think, is that attitudes toward the media have become increasingly polarized politically. And so we've reached a point in time where at the national level, the sources that you consume are driven almost entirely by whether there's a D or an R in front of your name. And at the local level, the time is short. We still haven't gotten to the point where we're that polarized yet. So if there's going to be any kind of momentum behind a movement to try and reinvigorate local political news, it's now because Pew data suggests that attitudes toward local news are becoming increasingly polarized, but we still have a window before it's for a foregone conclusion. All right, uh, Daisuke. Yeah, I just wanted to add um, that although um, types of help from the states can be obviously very useful, they also have their downsides, particularly if they seem to um, 
be favoring the media more than other companies. And that can actually lead to a backlash at some times. Um, when the consumption tax in Japan was raised a few years ago, the newspaper industry quite um, strongly petitioned that it should have a lower tax rate um, because it was an essential good for life. Um, but this actually led to quite a big backlash against the media um, saying, why are you going to be favored with more than other industries? So I'm just point, saying that, that these, these types of decisions can have um, unforeseen sort of consequences. Um, I, I know that we're going to lose a couple of you uh, uh, here at five past the hour. So, so, and we're getting some more questions coming in. So perhaps we can get to these uh, quickly. Um, uh, uh, one writer says, I would love to hear your thoughts on the business model of advanced publications and, and for that matter, other companies uh, folding local news outlets, uh, uh, print outlets into digital uh, publications. Um, and what effect uh, this is having on the state of local news and local news consumption. Uh, we've seen that happen, I think, in a number of markets across, across the US. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think it all really comes down. I mean, regardless of what format you put it out in, it, it really has to have content, right? Unique content that makes people wanna buy your product. Uh, Rasmus hit it uh, on the head completely when he says, you know, you look, if you romanticize the old model and you just wish those ads were coming back or you wish the readership was different or had different tastes, uh, that's not going to solve the problem. You have to really, really be smart about how you go about your operation. You have to produce content that you can't get elsewhere and you have to tell that story to the potential readers. This is something that's going to add value to your life. I think what Sadie was talking about uh, was, was a prime example. We did a large climate change uh, series last year and it, it was extremely well read, brought a lot of new subscriptions in. And I think it's, it, people could not get that elsewhere. So I think, again, whether it's online, in print or whatever format you wanna put in, you gotta offer something that people wanna buy. Uh, uh, one, one other question. Uh, this is an interesting one. Uh, what challenges do local news organizations face uh, uh, when confronting hostile uh, governors and legislatures um, that are not fond of uh, independent journalism? Jen, that might be a good one for you. Yeah, I mean, that's just called Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever. <laughs> Politicians have generally never been that excited about the press, the rhetoric that's used and the, I think, explicit hostile language that Trump and some of the Republicans are now using might be new, but this general sense of, oh, they're pushing a little bit too much and they're exposing me to my constituents is been going, you know, has been going on for hundreds of years. So I, I think at this point, the one upside to the fact that most of the news that we have is not government subsidized is that reporters don't have to worry that much about it. And there still does seem to be a premium on freedom of the press. The most recent example, I think Jim Acosta at CNN, um, you know, he, he won that debate, uh, he won that fight. And I, I think that the that citizens care a lot about that. So, you know, there's pushback, but on both sides of the aisle, there seems to be evidence to suggest that voters and other constituents believe that they should have access to independent information. So as long as the government isn't the primary funder of our news, you know, I, I think it's just same old, same old. And, th and that's a good thing. Right, right. I would actually say that antagonistic politicians are some way better for news organizations. Um, if you look at the subscriptions under the Trump administration, they're actually going up. It's more, and we see similar situations in abroad as well. It's more really when it's indifference that's really troublesome. Right, right. Well, um, I thank you for all of you uh, for your patience for uh, for sticking with us as we went a little bit long. We still have some questions in the queue that we're not going to be able to get to. I apologize uh, to those. We, we did have many good questions today. Um, I, I want to thank uh, my colleague uh, uh, Penny Abernathy um, and Rasmus Nielsen and Jen Lawless, uh, Glenn Smith, uh, Sadie Bappitz, and Daisuke Nakai. Uh, and, and I also want to thank Sabine. Sabina Murphy again uh, for, um, for her support of this project. And thanks to my colleagues at Medill so, uh, for helping with the technology today. So uh, thank you all very much and please look for our report in the next couple of weeks. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you for having us.
Thank you. Thank you.